Good morning. It's good to see you all on yet another rainy Sunday morning. So um, thank you for braving the weather and coming out. And for those of you who are joining us uh, online in worship today, we uh, a couple weeks ago we found ourselves in Freeing Jesus, Diana Butler Bass's uh, little book that we've been reading, reflecting on our experience of Jesus as Savior. Um, I'm sure you can all recall all of that sermon, but um, just a bit of it. Um, it was grounded in what I said was the heart of that, the text for the day. And uh, the angel's admonition to the shepherds, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. One of the most common refrains in the Bible, do not be afraid. Uh, I said then, that Sunday, that a lot of life is driven, defined by fear, unfortunately. A lot of the animosity and divisions and conflict that we experience in our world today, it's, it's rooted in fear. That's its origin. Wars are often um, grounded in, flow out of uh, fear. And I reminded us on that Sunday, a few weeks ago, that the good news is not, um, you're bad, you're guilty, God's angry with you, be afraid. That is not the good news. The good news is life-giving and liberating. It sets us free from fear in order that we might be um, faithful, that we might live life to the full. Do not be afraid because you have a Savior. Jesus, who is the living embodiment of love and hope, our teacher, our friend, and our Lord, who came that we might experience union with God, friendship with God, and therein find and experience the fullness of life. So here we are, a few weeks later, into the book, uh, Freeing Jesus, this week's chapter on Jesus as the way, and that refrain appears again. To the disciples and to Jesus' closest friends, who know that something is about to, to change, that Jesus is about to leave them, and that he won't be with them in the same way he has been up until that point, to guide and to comfort, to support, to strengthen. The refrain comes to them again, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This morning's reading from John's Gospel is a part of a larger section in the Gospel of John known as the Farewell Discourse, roughly John 14 through 16. In the Farewell Discourse, Jesus is explaining to his disciples, to his friends, the significance of his coming, death, resurrection, and ascension, and he points them from there to the life that they are called to lead on the other side. You may recall that just a few verses earlier, prior to the farewell discourse, Jesus says, Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and where I am going, you cannot come. You can imagine how hard that must have been for them. The, the, the fear and confusion um, had to be palpable. But Jesus goes on to tell them, in the midst of that, what they are to do when he is no longer physically present with them in the same way. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also you should love one another. And they know precisely what love looks like. By this time in the story, Jesus has been on his hands and knees washing his disciples Feet they've seen over the course of three years, how he's enacted with others, how he's treated the people that they've met along the way. Do not be afraid, he says. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Live in this way. Reflect my love and my hope into the world. Now they have questions about what this means. Peter, of course, blurts out, Lord, where are you going? And Thomas asks, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Bass notes that they're scared for themselves, they're scared of losing their friend. This whole story alternates between fear and love and worry and trust and abandonment and comfort. The disciples are frightened that their friend, their teacher, is leaving them. 
Jesus reassures them that he will be with them through love and trust and faith in him, not in ideas about him. I've loved you, he says. Abide in my love. Abiding in Jesus' love, the disciples came to understand, um, is not primarily about thinking some right thoughts about Jesus, saying the correct words, imagining Jesus as an idea to which we ascend. It's, it's about relationship. Abide, dwell, make your home in me as I have made my home in you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the place where heaven and earth meet. The presence of the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And and there is in this kingdom, he says, room for everyone. If you want to live life in this place, he says, come with me, follow me, live as I have lived. Love as I have loved. Therein lies the path, the way. As as we begin to move, which is kind of the call of the the gospel call, to move into the direction of, of God's dream for the world, God's preferred future, what we often call the kingdom, it's critical that we we enter this journey not with our minds already made up not with a a set, fixed, well-defined idea of who God is, and then we squeeze Jesus into that. God is not, as the philosopher says, me said in a louder voice. The invitation is to look at Jesus, to pay attention to him. The, The one who wept at the tomb of his friend, who welcomed and made space for children, who ate with the outcast and all kinds of sinners, who considered them worthy to be at the banquet table, who who welcomed the religious other, folks like the Samaritans, who befriended women, said to those secure in their own religion, I have sheep not of this fold. He washed his followers' feet, forgave his persecutors and enemies. The movement from fear, the movement towards the kingdom, the movement from fear to truth to life, requires us to look at Jesus and see in Him the way of God. I've said this before, the the goal of Christianity is not, as some have made it, securing our place in heaven when we die, or submission to divinely ordained religious authorities, or electing our set of leaders so that we can impose our will on on the other side, or, or... living our best life, or any of the other things we often confuse with the Christian faith. The goal, the telos, the end of this life to which Jesus has invited us is nothing less than friendship with God. I came that you may have life to the full. And Jesus, the Son, the incarnation of God's love, is the way from fear to that fullness of life. It's not easy. It is cross-shaped. Suffering and joy, death and resurrection are intertwined in this journey, and it is not a straight line. Uh, Bass puts it this way, Jesus is not an interstate to glory. It's full of switchbacks, spirals, unexpected turns, mysteries, paradox, but Jesus walks with us as teacher, Savior, Lord, friend. Now, we, that's a pretty good word for the day. Like, we could go home after that. Um, but, but if you know how um, Scripture is um, noted, there, if you read the Greek or the Hebrew uh, text of Scripture, there are no verses and chapters and all that stuff. We add that so we can find things in the Bible, mainly. Um, that was uh, verse 6a, which means um, there are two sentences in this verse. In verse 6, there are two sentences. We read, uh, Dave read verse A. Uh, I did not have him read verse B. Um, Because it'd be nice to just stop at verse A. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But then Jesus goes on 
to 6b. No one comes to the Father except through me. And there we have it. We were good up to that point. Now we get to this exclusionary stuff. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christians have used this verse to prove our superiority, to clobber our opponents, and to prove that we're right. We've abused people, we've done harm to people, with the very words of the one who we say is the incarnation of love. (laughs) And what I want us all to understand is that's a misuse of this text. Um, It's making it say something that it was never intended to say, to fit our agenda, to secure our position, our power, to to control others, maybe even to control our own fears, right? If we can be that certain about it, then any doubts I have just fade away. Gail O'Day has a wonderful commentary on the Gospel of John in which she notes that the word way within the Jewish wisdom tradition denotes the lifestyle of the wise, Those who live in accordance with the teaching of the wisdom teachers, with the prophets, with the sages. In the Psalms, the word way is used as a metaphor to describe life lived in in connection with or in, in accordance with the will and desire of God. Lived in accordance with God's dream and hope for all people. Way is not used as a as a way of describing how to get from A to B, but an expression of a faithful person's unity with God. Way, in other words, is a metaphor for our life with God. And as the Word made flesh, Jesus makes the truth of God's love, the truth of God's dream of a world where all experience hope in life available to the world. No one comes to the Father except through me, or better, not one of you knows the Father apart from me. It's not a general metaphysical statement about God in all times and in all places. It's the very concrete and specific affirmation of a particular faith community, John's community, for whom the incarnation meant everything. You have to read this verse in light of where John begins. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. That shapes everything that comes after it for John and his community. The incarnation, Jesus as God's love in the flesh, changes everything for them. Because through it, humanity's relationship to God and God's relationship with humanity is decisively altered. The Incarnation has redefined for John and for those for whom he writes um, his understanding of God. Because the Incarnation brings the tangible presence of God's love into the world. So when Jesus says no one, he really means none of you. Talking to his disciples and friends. None of you knows God in this way apart from your relationship with me. Jesus is the way that they've connected with God's love and God's hope for the world in a very particular and profound sort of way. It's important that we hear this in its context. As Gil O'Day goes on to point out, this is not the sweeping claim of a major world religion. This is the first century. This is not the sweeping claim of a major world religion. This is... um, This is not Christianity at that point in time. This is the particular conviction of a a religious minority in the Mediterranean world. What's often described as exclusionary is better understood as particular. That is, the claims made here express the particular knowledge that John has and John's particular experience of God and that of his community. This is who we are, he's saying. We are the people who believe in the God who has been revealed to us in Jesus. It doesn't exclude those, um, the truth that's found in other places. Remember, Jesus says, I have sheep not of this fold. 
O'Day goes on to point out that this phrase becomes problematic when we use it to to answer questions that it it didn't have in mind, to use it as a a way to battle over the merits of the world's religions. The fourth gospel is not concerned about Hinduism and Buddhism, and and Muslims were not even a thing at that point. And and it's not trying to, to to, to decide between the superiority of Christianity or Judaism. These verses are the joyful, confessional celebration of a particular faith community convinced of the truth and life that they had experienced in the incarnation of Jesus. So what in the world does that mean for us some 2,000 years later? Well, it means in large part what it meant for them. Following Jesus is moving from fear to love. Fear seeks to control both us and others. Love casts out fear and sets us free to follow the way of Jesus. Sometimes, I think, when the church has been afraid, when we've been more afraid than loving, we've replaced believing or trusting in Jesus with what we believe about Jesus. When we've been more afraid than loving, we've used doctrine, our teaching, as a way to control because we're afraid. Please know, doctrine, what we believe, it matters. It's really important. Um, But it is a resource for the journey, not the destination. Christianity does believe certain things about God, and it doesn't believe other things about God. That's true. But it is primarily a way of life. Jesus didn't say, come and believe. He said, what? Come and follow, right? Come and follow. Come spend your life with me. And see. It's faith-seeking understanding, as Anselm put it. Bass finally points out, the Christian faith is nothing less than a vision of flourishing that bears witness to God's love at work everywhere in the world so that way is not a noun but a verb. Jesus as the way is about relationship and experience and about following what Jesus taught and lived. And it's ultimately about love. And love properly understood is not primarily an emotion or a feeling. It can, that can be part of it. But it is a long obedience in the same direction in which we consistently seek the good of the other, especially those others who are captive to their fear, those others who lack hope and and love and life. The way of Jesus or the way of love pursues friendship with God, the thriving of all of our neighbors, As we reflect, we the church reflect the face of God to a suffering world. That is the truth, friends. And that truth leads to life. And Jesus is the way. Thanks be to God. Amen.